Moving on to part two of our AACC tour and research spotlight, I'm going to now share with you a bit of my own research, which was supported by the AACC, and that examines some of the experiences of first-generation Japanese immigrants in the American West as told through artifacts. Between roughly 1880 and 1924, over 100,000 Japanese laborers, entrepreneurs, families, and eventual American citizens arrived in North America. This diverse group of first-generation Japanese immigrants, who are also known as Issei, made lasting impacts on the economies, industries, and communities of the American West. They also, as we will see, left an undeniable archaeological signature on the landscape. Yet despite this, archaeological research has been slow to address Japanese Americans, and it has been especially slow in the identification and analysis of Japanese ceramics, which is why in this presentation, I'm gonna focus my discussion on historical Japanese ceramics recovered from three pre-World pre War II archeological sites located in the California Delta, Mukilteo, Washington, and Gresham, Oregon. These sites, summarized here, represent some of the unique experiences and contributions of Issei communities. As you can see, the sites were occupied during slightly different time periods. They have different community demographics and represent different industries, yet they all have at least one thing in common, which is that they all left behind an archaeological record rich with Japanese manufactured ceramics. That vessels like these were integral to the daily lives of residents at these sites can be seen in the large proportion of Japanese ceramics in each assemblage. Nearly 90% of the tablewares, ceramics used to serve and consume food, in all three assemblages are porcelain, and these are dominated by hand-painted, transfer-printed, and stenciled zamnesuke, ceramics with cobalt blue decoration like the ones pictured here. The residents of each of these sites did not exclusively use Japanese ceramics, but from the prevalence of decoration types and forms, handleless teacups like this one, for example, it is clear that site residents shared a preference for the domestic ceramics common to late 19th and early 20th century Japan. So what can ceramic shards like these reveal about Issei experiences in the West? In order to answer that question, I believe that we need a better understanding of what these artifacts were and what they represented to the people who so clearly chose to incorporate them into their daily lives. And this is where the resources at the AACC underpin this research. In my analysis, I'll be using a classification system developed with the help of experts in the field and with the materials on file at the AACC. Using standardized classification terms is important because it allows me to compare items between different sites, but the major advantage of this classification is its incorporation of Japanese terms by relying as much as possible on historical Japanese descriptions of objects, classification categories more closely approximate the way that Issei site residents would have understood the vessels that are the subject of this analysis. More information about vessel classification can be found at the website shown on this slide, which was a collaborative project between the AACC, the Burke Museum in Seattle, and the CDIL at the University of Idaho. The tree visualization that you see here is also from that website, and it's, a, it's much more interesting online because it's interactive. You can click on the different blue and white circles to expand or contract the different levels of classification. And then when you get to the end, you can click on the vessel form name, and that will take you to a separate page with pictures of that artifact and also some descriptions. So this is the typology that I'm going to use throughout this presentation, and that I hope can give us a better understanding of some of the experiences of Japanese immigrant communities in the West. Turning back to these historical communities, I'm going to begin with the Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta or California Delta region. The first Issei arrived in this area at the end of the 19th century as laborers for land reclamation efforts. The Delta now contains some of California's most productive land, but prior to reclamation, it was a massive swampy system of sloughs and seasonally exposed islands. Accounts of early reclamation efforts describe this area as a barren and desolate landscape, abundant with mosquitoes, typhoid and malaria, and notoriously isolated and difficult to farm. To contend with these challenging conditions, Japanese farmers developed a number of strategies, including cooperative partnerships, specialized farming techniques, and migratory camps spread across Delta Islands. Labor camps operated by Issei entrepreneur George Shima are an example of the living and working arrangements on the Delta. Shima was one of the Delta's most successful farmers, who by 1920 controlled 85% of California's potato crop, a fact that earned him the nickname of Potato King in contemporary newspaper articles like this one. Yet his status as a first-generation Japanese immigrant prevented him from legally owning land, and a 1913 alien land law further limited his lease tenure on any specific parcel to just three years. Because of these discriminatory laws and the difficulty in accessing Delta Islands, 
like this one, in the years before bridges and roads were built, Shima's camps were by necessity self-sufficient but temporary establishments. These camps, which could house from 20 to 400 people, contained a mixture of single laborers and families who lived in bunkhouses constructed two stories tall to circumvent flooding. About half of the residences in Shima's camps contained women and children who participated in both farm labor and the preparation of communal meals. The importance of these interpersonal relationships may in fact be reflected in the archaeological assemblage recovered from one of Shima's camps. This assemblage contains several vessels that may have been given as gifts. One of these is the katagami or stenciled rice bowl pictured here. The characters on this bowl indicate celebration and a hope for good fortune and would have made it an appropriate gift for a birthday or anniversary present. Many of the Japanese ceramics in this collection also appear to reflect the isolated and temporary nature of living in the Delta. The assemblage is dominated by bowls used for rice or soup and by teacups like these. Side dishes, serving vessels, and specialized forms are conspicuously absent from this assemblage. Communal meals and the migration of camps may have meant that laborers used only a limited number of tablewares, reducing the burden of transporting excess goods between islands. Many of the ceramics in this collection also feature less expensive or out-of-date decorative styles, like katagami, which, have, which would have already been losing popularity by the time the site was occupied. Yet this collection contains the most katagami of the three. Additionally, the marks seen on these two bottom vessels translate to what are probably restaurant names or locations, indicating that these otherwise undecorated bowls were likely promotional items or used restaurant wares, sold at a discount or given away for advertising purposes. These vessels suggest that frugality and isolation characterize the day-to-day -day life among the waterbound islands of the California Delta, yet they are also emblematic of the strategies that made Issei, Issei so successful here transforming the Delta into some of California's most productive agricultural lands. Moving about 650 miles north of the California Delta, we are next gonna look at an agricultural community of approximately 170 Japanese families located 15 miles east of Portland in an area that's now known as Gresham. Issei settled in Oregon somewhat later than in California and pursued a wider variety of occupations. As a result, agricultural communities like the one established in Gresham tended to be smaller and more dispersed than those in other states. And because Oregon did not have laws limiting lease tenure, many Oregon Issei were able to establish long-term residency, though not land ownership, which in turn provided more opportunities to invest in crops and to reunite trans-Pacific families. The Tanaka family provides an example of one such truck farming family. The Tanakas were a multi-generational family who immigrated to the United States in stages. And this photo is not of the Tanaka family, um, but it is another Japanese farm in Oregon from the same time period. Heyakaturo Tanaka, the first family member to immigrate, arrived in the United States in 1898. After working for a few years, he was joined by his wife and their eldest son in 1905. In 1914, the family sent for their youngest son, who married in Seattle before joining the rest of the family in Gresham. Census data from 1920 and 1930 describe the Tanakas as self-employed truck farmers. The 1930 census lists four male lodgers also residing at their address, suggesting that they, like other Gresham Issei, occasionally hired laborers, but likely performed the majority of farm work as a family unit. The Tanakas rented their farm for over 25 years from a woman named Clara Smith and appear to have kept in touch with her even after being forced to relocate at the start of World War II. Within this context of small family farms, purchases were likely made on a household level, and the Tanaka assemblage, a small portion of which can be seen here, seems to illustrate the consumption habits of a single family unit. This collection is the most uniform in terms of decoration, perhaps reflecting the aesthetic preferences of Heiakutaro's wife. Unlike the assemblage from the California Delta, the Tanaka's tablewares include several serving vessels, like the sake decanter and jarlet fragments seen here, which combined with other place settings are indicative of family dining practices. Almost all of the vessels in the Tanaka assemblage feature minimalistic somesuke decoration, with the exception of this one bowl shirt over here. Mirroring trends within the Japanese ceramic industry in the 1920s and 1930s. Historical records show that the Tanaka family members made several trips back and forth to Japan while in Gresham and the popular aesthetics of their ceramics may reflect their attention to trends within the Japanese ceramics industry, or perhaps even the purchase of some of these vessels while traveling. The 
the Tanaka's ability to travel and their long-term residency in Gresham also indicate financial security. By 1930, Japanese truck farmers like the Tanaka's were supplying 75% of the vegetables sold at the Portland market and sold produce at many of the local restaurants. So finally, about 200 miles directly north of Gresham, the Mukultio sawmill, pictured in the map insert on this slide, was established in 1903 on Puget Sound. At the turn of the century, Washington had become the nation's largest lumber producer, creating a need for large pools of labor that were often recruited directly from Japan. The relatively permanent employment and higher wages of Pacific Northwest sawmills also tended to attract Issei from other industries and other states. Japanese laborers made up the majority of the employees at the Mukilteo sawmill and lived in a self-constructed village on mill property called Japanese Gulch. At its peak population in 1920, Japanese Gulch Village consisted of 94 men, 29 women, and 44 children. Accounts from former residents indicate that village members took great pride in their community. Several interviewees recall that Japanese Gulch had a reputation for being the ideal Japanese sawmill camp in the whole Northwest, largely because residents were allowed to elect their own bookman, a community representative who negotiated with company management on their behalf, but also because residents enjoyed access to a wide range of foods and goods. Japanese Gulch families had the option of purchasing items locally from community or company-run stores, and many people fished, gathered clams and seaweed, and grew their own vegetables. Foods and household goods were also purchased in bulk from regional import companies. Former village residents remember that salesmen from two different Japanese wholesalers would visit the village at least once a month from Seattle. When these purchasing habits angered some of the local white business owners, the complaint voiced in newspaper articles like these, residents of Japanese Gulch made a concerted effort to appease their neighbors by buying more of their items locally and to quote a former resident as they did, the anti-Japanese atmosphere gradually cleared. Yet as we will see in the archeological assemblage, despite this pressure to the contrary, residents clearly retained access to Japanese ceramics. The wide variety of vessels in the Japanese Gulch Village collection provide a number of insights into daily life for mill workers and their families. Chowan, the most numerous vessels, together with Kozara and Mamezara, offer evidence that traditional Japanese meals of rice accompanied by side dishes and sauces may have been common. The number of tea wares and sake vessels, like these, also suggest that Japanese Gulch residents regularly consumed these beverages. And while a few Katagami vessels appear in this collection, most of the assemblage likely dates from the 1910s through 1930s, after residents had supposedly shifted to making only local purchases. Some shirts in the Japanese Gulch collection even suggest manufacture by specific pottery centers or artists. The lead glazes on this teapot lid, for example, suggest that it was manufactured in Kyushu, a region where at least one Japanese Gulch resident was born. The decoration on this teapot rim shirt is even more distinctive and can be associated with a particular craftswoman, Minagawa Matsu, who was active in several parties in the Mishiko region during the early to mid 20th century. Her landscape teapots, like this one here, became a recognizable icon of Japan's folk craft movement and gained international attention when one received first place at the 1938 International Craft Exhibit in Berlin. Cumulatively, these ceramics provide small but enduring examples of ways that residents fostered well being within their community and managed to appease local businesses and improve community relations while also maintaining access to a continued variety of Japanese ceramics within their ideal sawmill camp. So in conclusion, I just want to emphasize that despite the title of this talk, neither Japanese ceramic assemblages nor this, these three sites alone can come close to encompassing the vast array of people and events that we hope to honor when we celebrate both archeological and Asian Pacific American heritage. But examining these artifacts can reveal some of the finer texture of daily life from eating communal meals out of reused restaurant wares on a reclaimed island, to serving condiments from a samesuke jarlet at the family table, to navigating around local prejudice to purchase a teapot from a home village in Japan. These artifacts offer glimpses of the abundant hard work, personal relationships, sacrifices, and successes that define Japanese experiences in the West. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you for listening and also to the Utah State Historic Preservation Office for hosting this.
Um, and I wanted to leave you with just a few links to some more information on Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and on Japanese American history and archaeology.